are listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, a podcast recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I am originally from the Netherlands and I am married to a Palestinian. We live in Beit Safafa between Jerusalem and Bethlehem and we run Singer Cafe and Al Chisar Bar in Beit Sahur. Before moving to Palestine in 2013, I worked as a teacher and tour guide in the Netherlands. I have a degree in history and in tour guiding and many years of tour guiding experience. Due to the COVID pandemic, tourism in Palestine came to a complete halt and that's why I started Stories from Palestine podcast in August 2020. This is the second year of the podcast with every week on Monday a new episode about the history and heritage of Palestine as well as the reality of life today. I hope you will enjoy today's episode. This is the last podcast episode of this season. We are in the Netherlands on a vacation. And as last week, I have for you this week an episode that I recorded for Pax Palestine podcast. And this is an interview with Iman Alayan about Ghazaan, an initiative that creates a Palestinian archive located in Sheikh Jarrah and also available online. You are listening to the Pax Palestine podcast, a podcast that features interviews with some of the local Palestinian partners of Pax, a peace organization based in the Netherlands. Pax works together with committed citizens and partners to protect civilians against acts of war, to end armed violence and to build a just peace. In Palestine, Pax supports local partners in building resilient communities, promoting human security and equality in the political, cultural and social domain and in fighting the injustices resulting from the protracted occupation. My name is Crystal and I'm your host. I am a Dutch citizen living in Palestine with my Palestinian husband and two children. Besides running a cafe and a bar in Bethlehem, I produce a weekly podcast called Stories from Palestine. Last year, I produced three episodes for Pax with interviews with local Palestinian partner organizations. And now you can listen to new episodes produced in 2022. We are in Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, in a building that hosts Gezaen. And it's a small building with just three rooms. And I'm standing here with Iman and we are looking at a huge cupboard full of cardboard boxes. And on each box, there is something written on it in Arabic. And my Arabic is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay, but it reads very slowly. And I see a couple of boxes of books. And I'm very curious to know more from you about Ghazai and what you are doing, what this project is all about. But first of all, can you maybe introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, of course. First of all, thank you for doing this podcast. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, my name is Iman. I'm from Jerusalem, from Betsafafa. I did my uh, BA in journalism and English literature and my master's in sociology and cultural studies. I've been a part of Ghazai for four years right now. And I feel home here and I'm so happy that you're here. Ghazain, what does it mean? Okay, so Ghazain literally can translate to cabinets. The name was inspired by libraries in Andalus. 
they used to call it Khazan al Ma'rifa, Khazan al Ilm, which is like cabinets of knowledge, cabinets of, of science. That is the entire idea here. And Khazan means cabinet. And what you described is a cabinet for each person. And I will tell you more about the idea right now. So the idea of Khazan is that we are an archive working on preserving Palestinian and Arabic materials. The initiative started in 2016. It was all voluntarily, a lot of volunteers from different parts of the Arab world and in Palestine decided that it was very important to preserve and collect all of the materials and everything that was published and being published in Palestine and in the Arab world because no one is actually collecting all of this ephemera and the ephemeral material. Ephemera is everything that doesn't last for a long period of time. There's a lot of archives in there that you can see some manuscript, some diaries or some books, but no one really puts the uh, the emphasis on let's try and and collect what is now being published and what is now, what are we living now? Because as you know, in, in Jerusalem and in Palestine, we are facing the fear of disappearing like every single day. And if we want to go and search for history or for all the manuscripts and all the documents that tells us about us, and if we want to do research, a lot of time, unfortunately, we have to go to colonial archives, to the Israeli National Library, for example, who has millions of archival materials about the Palestinian cause. And that in itself is very devastating for us. So if you want to understand our own history Maybe let's start and collect it in one Palestinian place, like, you know. And so, yeah, it started in 2016 as an initiative. And then it slowly became an organization. And we had a couple of, uh, of projects throughout the years. A lot of them are working with people, with students and gathering as much materials as we can. As you can see here, every cabinet has the name of the owner of the archive and they all, you also have the flag. So you can see that we have cabinets like Khazan uh, from Lebanon, from Syria, from Qatar, from Jordan, from Palestine. And this wouldn't have worked without the help of all of our friends and all of our supporters. And the idea that to get your archive in Jerusalem is in itself symbolic. You know, because there are a lot of people here that, for example, there is one cabinet here by the name of uh, Yafa, and Yafa is Palestinian. She's right now a refugee. She's right now doing her PhD, I think, in Lebanon. We received her materials and she said to us that, I feel that now I'm returning. I will return, but first, here's all my collection. Here's everything that I collected for you. So there's also, it's a symbol that we here are not only preserving history, but we are now preserving the right moment, this moment right now, which for the next generation will finally be preserved in not a colonial archive. It will be in a Palestinian place and we're trying to collect everything that we can in one place. Also, what's very interesting is that every person has his own... You can understand the story of a person through his cabinets, through his khazane. So... If a person is very interested in music, you'll see a lot of music events, arts galleries or openings. There's also a lot of personal photographies and uh, photographs and, and letters. A lot of people give us a lot of personal, personal images. And it's very, we're very honored to have all of this and to have the trust of the people. Usually... You know, like when you hear the word archive, you think, I personally think of, of a lot of old people sitting in a, in a, <laughs> in, in some sort of a building. No one goes there un unless you want to do your PhD and something. But here you see youth. You see that archive is becoming a habit. So just for example, last week when there was a, the funeral of Shirin Abu Aqla, the journalist that was assassinated by the Israeli army, we were in the funeral and I was seeing some of my friends, they were gathering posters and and collecting them. And I saw them and I was like, are you collecting them? And I was like, yes, yes, don't worry. These are for Khazan and they are for our own Khazan and we want them by our own name. So it's becoming a habit. And finally, people are starting to understand that if we want to document everything that is abnormal that is happening here and this crazy reality that we have here, we have to be a part of it. So in this archive, we find both 
things that are happening basically today and that you are already archiving for the future. And you also find things from the past that are collected from different individuals. So how do you reach out to these individuals or do they find you or how does that work? It's both ways, but we're very happy that a lot of people come to us and they they ask for for help for uh, for putting their materials here, and it's a big honor, you know. Also, a very important thing is that we take care of the material in an um, like a lot of people just put their letters and their photographs in a nylon thing and this ruined the papers this is not okay for the papers so everything that you see here is asset free it is especially made for protecting the material and protecting the paper from ruining yeah So yeah, they give us the things, we talk to them, we interview them, we ask them about their stories, and then the next step would be we have also a blog. So anyone can come here and look for the thing, of course, with permission from the uh, from the people. They can write articles, they can use the photos and the manuscripts and everything that we have here for their academic work work or their publications and we try to make it as much as as accessible to people as as it can be and we're very happy to help anyone who needs any kind of help with this yeah because i've been following you for some time now on social media and then especially on instagram you'd post a photo of something and then the story behind it and i think that is the most relevant because you can have a document a paper and you can read it but then there must always be that story behind it and that is what tells the heritage of palestine of jerusalem of uh, of the places where it comes from so How do you select these stories and how do you know much details about these stories? Yes, so archiving your history is a self-exploration. It's going back to your roots and sometimes it's becoming with good terms with your roots and with your own story. A lot of people came here and gave us some photos of their grandparents and grand-grandparents and they didn't know anything about them. And sometimes they just knew one information about them. So for example, like uh, someone came and he gave us everything that his grandfather had. He had all his diaries and photographs. He kept a, a book where he wrote how much people owed him. And he said that he was very grumpy. He was never smiling. He was very angry. And we we couldn't stand him because his energy was always negative. But then when he understood that he was trying to build a home, he was trying to build a house, and in the last sentence of his diary, it was written that Yaffa and Romle was taken, was occupied by the Israelis. He started to understand that, okay, that's now I understand why this guy is always mad and grumpy and sad. He lost everything that he that he had, and it was all in one instant moment. So this idea of all also going back and understanding the people that are close to you and what the Nakba did to them and how they dealt with things. So it's not just a piece of paper that you found. It's also your family, your own self and and how you relate to this story. And everything is, is stories. Mm. Like everything goes back to one story. So even one leaflet about a supermarket that would that was opened in 2000 let's say it can tell us about a street that today may not be here so the names of the streets you know like here especially in Jerusalem we're under occupation and colonization and they're trying to change the names of the streets and change our addresses and everything so now you can go back and find an address and that in 10 years may disappear And that's the strength in in not just finding the old past materials, but also today to document what is happening today and what the names of the streets are today. And you can also compare if we take one leaflet from 2022 and then one leaflet from 2020, not 2020, 10, for example, we can see maybe in the visual language how things are changing in the font and the words that are using, the addresses, the names of the people. It's all in the details. So it takes a lot of exploration, I would call it, to sit down and to look for things and to actually pay attention to the details. 
So imagine that somebody comes here and says, oh, I have something for your archive. Then how does it go? Do you sit down with that person and go through every document and every poster or every flyer that they bring and you record that? Can we open yeah. a box? <laughs> yeah. So basically there are uh, different materials. So if someone came, so for example, here is the Khazane of Samir Shteye. Samir Shteye has a lot of Ottomanic manuscripts from his family. So he comes, he sits with us and he gives us everything and then we scan. First of all, we preserve them in a, in a special box and in a special folder. And then we write on it, when did it come? Who is the owner? And then we scan it. So everything that we have is digitized as well. So the owner of the Khazane can have a digital copy of everything. And if he wants, he can have the physical copy back or he can save it here. So for example, if this is one. This is all from the Uthmanic period. You can see the year here. Wow, so we're opening a sort of a cardboard folder and what comes from inside is a number of slips of paper, yeah. a little bit brown from the age, aged paper, and then there is a lot of Arabic writing on it. They look like receipts. They are receipts, yes. If you can see, you can see the stamps over here that tell us that these, was, these were Uthmanic, oh, you know, yeah. like you can see the paintings here. Yeah. Do so you this, know what the receipts were for? This, for example, it was for a telegraph and a telephone. Ah, so somebody went, somebody sent know, a yeah. telegram to somewhere <laughs> yeah. abroad and had to pay for it and got the receipt yes. for it. And, and here you see, for example, you can see that it's written Jerusalem. It's a Sharif. So this was a stamp used in Jerusalem in yeah. year. It's a Hijri year. Oh, so it's written in the Islamic yeah, calendar. Islamic oh. calendar as well. It's wow. Something newer, maybe. These are all very, very old. 1931. This is from the Jerusalem municipality in 1937 and 1939. And these are the municipality receipts. So they are trying to to list a home, a house in the Jerusalem municipality here. Mm -hmm. And they've paid the first receipt in Wadi Joz in 13 November 37, 1937. It's interesting when you look at the receipt, it's very clearly states on the top of the receipt the word Palestine. Palestine. I mean, this is a, one of those proofs that when people say, well, Palestine never <laughs> existed yeah. before the state of Israel was yeah. created, is that there are official documents on which we clearly read the word Palestine. Also interesting that the receipt has English, Arabic and Hebrew on it. So this is the diary that I was telling you about. This is the diary. He was someone that uh, he used to work in the railway, Palestine Railway. And here you can see all the listings of things that he had to pay, things that people paid him. He basically, he had a, a garage. Mm. He was documenting everything. And then... Oh, Yeah, exactly. Every time someone would give him the money that they owned, he would just oh, yeah, cross it, cross it yeah. out. And he was trying to buy a house that was in the year 26. We are looking at a diary that is, it's an old, we would say daftar here, yeah, eh? yeah an old notebook. And it's, uh, of course, it's already been um, stitched with some glue here and also some uh, some scotch tape. And it is full of notes taken by the, that person. Do you know the name of the person? Adib Haddad. Aude Adib Haddad. And so in the 1930s, he works at the railway station and he's writing his notes, but he's also kind of writing his dream. He needs to make money in order to build his home. And then eventually, because of the events in 1948, he's not able to complete that. And this shows, you know, how much for us, for Palestinians in the 1948, Nakba was a... Um, the, our history started from there. And I don't think a lot of other nations have this because everything's changed. Everything changed in 1948 for us. Everything was affected by this. The lives of people, people became refugees, people fled their homes, people left everything that they have, and even the people that stayed here. We live the Nakba every day. So everything to us starts in 1948. Yeah. So I'm trying to find this here. He wrote 
the date where Ramla and Led fell. Mm. That they were occupied and then he had to leave. And what you see here is that he left to Jordan. So if you, here you have Jamaid al Muadhafin Sabiqin fi Falastin bi Amman. So he used to work, Sabiqin means uh, in the past, like latest. So he used to work in Palestine and then became a refugee in Amman in Az Zarqa refugee camp. His name is Oda Adib Hussein al Haddad. That's his full name. Here you can see the date of birth 1912, Palestine Railways. He used to be the roller driver. And this, when his grand-grandchild came and saw this, he understood that, well, he wasn't grumpy for for no reason. Like, he had his reasons and they ruined his dreams. And he was dreaming of building his own home in, in Ramle. And now he is a refugee in Jordan. And... This is where you see that the archive is a self-exploration also to understand what really happened. Yeah, I guess ancestry is so important because we know there is something called generational trauma also. So we get from our grandparents, great-grandparents, whether we knew them or not, we are transferred some of that, what they have experienced in many different ways. And then when you have access to such archival material and you are able to understand where people were coming from and what experiences they went through, that can shine a lot of light on yeah. how even you are today, how that influenced you. 12th of July, 1948, Monday, fell of Ramle al-Led, the occupation of the Jews. And then he just stopped. And if you can see, for every instance, for every event that happened to him, he used to write a lot of details. But here, it was just one clear sentence, and that's it. Yeah. It was yeah, over. It's... Maybe that's the moment when they left, and they ended up in a refugee camp. And maybe, well, maybe he brought it with him, but he'd never felt the need to continue to write mm -hmm. because there was no more dreams to work towards. Yeah, such a document gives a lot of insight. And so when you sit with people who bring this, mm -hmm. you talk with them, and then at some point you decide that some of these stories are important, mm -hmm. and then you use the social media to bring them out? Yes, we we use social media, and we also have our blog. In our blog, you can find a longer, deeper, um, and more thorough analysis of, of the events or of the materials that we, that we have. And in social media, we try as much as we can to be up to date with everything that is happening. So, for example, if there's something about Shirin Abu Akhle, we, we try to post our, our material about her. Or if there is uh, something that is happening in Janine, We try to find the things that we have and, you know, connect people to the past because the past is continuous and the present and the past, we can always learn from our past so we can actually change our future. And here we, we also think that it's so important for other people to use the material that we have, to use the archive that we have and write their own stories and write the stories that we all need to hear. And we all need to know because, you know, like if we don't know our history, if we don't know our stories, then we will, we will never, we'll never be free. We will never, nothing will change. It's a lot of work. It's a hard work, especially when there's generational trauma and sometimes you just wish that things were different, but we have to, to do this. Mm -hmm. We have to, and it's good that we, that we build this place of, of going back to somewhere that is collecting everything instead of, again, going to colonial archives. Mm -hmm. And even in colonial archives, you know, like nothing, there's a lot of things that can't be published that we don't know about and we don't have access to. And it's not only, you know, physical occupation and colonization, it's in every aspect. And especially when it comes to your own history, it's devastating. And I think that we have to resist this in every way possible. So how many people do you have working in the office for Ghazan? We have around five people that are working here, but there's a lot of volunteers. And uh, it's basically everything that we have here right now is with the help of a lot of volunteers that are living also in Palestine and also in other countries. And I think uh, also the idea that people are helping us while they're living abroad strengthen the connection and makes it more important that 
There shouldn't be any borders, you know, like Lebanon is just around the corner, <laughs> but still we feel that it's so, so far away. Not even Lebanon, let's think about Gaza. Whenever we have a slip of paper of Gaza, like a friend of mine gave me, like she gave Khazan a paper from Gaza that was just, it was not even a paper, it was a napkin from a restaurant, but it was from Gaza. So it was like a celebration here, like we have something from Gaza, no, yani, finally. <laughs> And I think this also makes it important that our office is in Jerusalem. Mm. So we are here. Like It's also connecting all of the parts. And if we can at least be united in our materials and in the place of gathering them, mm. then that's, yeah. that's good. We're doing this podcast for Pax, a mm. peace organization in the Netherlands. They mm. are supporting you. Yes. Do you find support also from other international institutions or organizations or even local? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. so we get a lot of, uh, we have a lot of support from Pax right now. We had from Rawa, which is Creative Palestinian Community Fund. Uh, we have from Al Mawred Thaqafi. We worked with the UNDP and AM Qattan Foundation, also Abdel Hamid Shuman and uh, Palestine Investment Fund. And it's important for us, you know, like who is funding us. Like we we take really good care about this. Like it's important. Mm. And the biggest thing is also the help of the people with their materials. Like even trusting you with giving us all of this is important. And, um, and also, like you know, like networking and even telling other people about Ghazain. Mm. Um We have a tote bag and uh, a friend was walking in London and then another person who was from Algeria, she started asking her about about it and what is this? And then she opened the Instagram page and the, the blog and, you know, just spreading the knowledge and spreading the blog and, and everything that we have here is, yeah. is important. And if somebody is listening now to this podcast episode and says, I am a Palestinian from Gaza and I live in the Netherlands and I have materials here that I would like to send to Jerusalem. People can just approach you and say, I have these materials and then they can either bring it or have somebody take it here. Yes, 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 exactly. And that that's the that's the whole point. <laughs> we have volunteers all around the world and we we do our best to actually bring the materials, especially from Palestinian in this in the diaspora. It's so important for us because you know, like every person is a story and without their story, our collective story would be would be lost or would always be missing. So for a collective story and collective history to actually be accurate we need each and every person so yeah just contact us on social media or on our website and we will figure it out also i'd like to talk about last year you know when there was uh, in may when there was uh, you know sheikh jarrah and janine and all of the events that were happening last year we created this archive and we we did a call for everyone for all activists for all people to document Everything that is happening, it's digital, both digital and physical, because we thought that, you know, archiving is not only a habit, but it's also a tool for resistance. So we asked for everyone to bring everything about all the events that was happening. And then we have collection that is called Nektub Tarikhina. We are writing our history, writing our history. And this has everything about the events of May 2021. So yeah, you're you showing see. me that now here on yeah. the computer screen, the page on the website, and there's a lot of digitalized posters and photos and pamphlets, brochures that are all related to what was happening last year around this yeah. time. So here, for example, you have Marathon Al-Quds and you have Anqidhu Hay Sheikh Jarrah, Anqidhu Silwan, Save Silwan, Save Sheikh Jarrah. You have uh, this from uh, Abed Hashlamon, who actually drew this. Mishmet Zahzeh Qa'ad Fiha, which was one of the posters that was used in Sheikh Jarrah. You have a lot of work from artists. They all sent us their work. This was from Gaza and from Qatar. Do not stop supporting Palestine. And you can see also the difference in um, in like the visual art in each mm. <laughs> and every one. Mm. So here, for example, you have, there was a week for um, supporting the Palestinian economy. So uh, 
the idea was to just buy from Palestinians and just, you know, support locals. Yeah, there yeah. is a poster where we have a number of pictures of locally grown products. And I see Ramallah. grapes and I, oh, it's from Ramallah. Ramallah. Yeah, Ramallah and cucumbers and mlochia and beans. And the, this is in order to to show people. I, actually, that's good because you go to the supermarket, you don't know where it's <laughs> from. But yeah. if you buy local, so you know it's from the from your own soil. Yeah, and here you have also like documentation of all demonstrations that was happening around the world. So he, mm -hmm. here you have from uh, Geneva. Picture of people standing <laughs> with winter jackets in the rain, <laughs> definitely not in Palestine. Definitely not. Yeah, pro promoting uh, the Palestinian cause with big Palestinian yeah. flags. Beautiful photo here also of a Palestinian woman in a thobe yeah. doing shrak, I think. Shrak? This is a very flat bread, looks yeah. almost like a pancake. This was Beautiful. The, yeah, this was happening in Lifta. Lifta is one of the destroyed Lifta. villages eh? that yeah. was in 1948. Well, actually, they left most of the houses standing and they mm -hmm. just uh, made a big hole in the roof so that people couldn't come back. But it's one of those villages that was completely depopulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But coming back there and celebrating Shrak, <laughs> yeah, that's a really yeah. strong statement. Exactly. And this is also about the strike that was happening last year in uh, 18th of, uh, of May. This was by the artist herself. She yeah. gave it to us, uh, Hani Nazal. The strike was such an important day last mm -hmm. year where people from all over Palestine, from West Bank, Gaza, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, from 48, for one day, they didn't go to work. And that definitely really affected also the Israeli economy. Mm -hmm. And you would easily forget about it. Yeah. But now when no. you see the poster again, you remember how important that day was. Exactly. And it's great to see how much collaboration you have and how everyone was working together. In the same week, there were events happening in Haifa. You can see there were events happening in Ramallah, as we saw, and in Al-Quds. There were also a lot of leaflets and pamphlets, you know, um, describing and, uh, and letting people know what is happening, why we're doing this, what is happening, why we should buy from, our, uh, from Palestinians, and how can this affect us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we were calling for everyone to come, give us these leaflets, put it there in your names. In your cabinet, and at the same time, it's documenting a very important period of our history. Mm. And this was, I think, the first time that people realized that we don't document things when they're over. We document them while they're happening, mm. especially when you live in Palestine. Because yeah. every day is a struggle, and every day we may disappear. <laughs> people yeah. are trying, like, we are disappearing. And it was an act. It was a resistance. Yeah. I would like to see if you have a few items that can give us a couple of stories as example, because what I like so much about this project is that you're trying to archive and keep for the future, but you're also trying to bring stories to life. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you'd have to do, I don't know, like through the social media, mm -hmm. maybe you could even imagine a theater group playing yeah. out some yeah. of the <laughs> some of the stories, yeah. but also on a podcast, you can share some of these stories. Do you have a couple of examples of, of stories that came up while you were collecting this archive? Oh, here she brought out a box with lots of small diaries. They are like pocket size almost. 50 years of diaries. This is 50 years of documentation uh, of Badr Sharaf. He is a grandparent of uh, one of our very good, uh, good colleagues, Rawan Sharaf. He documented everything. He used to work with wheat. He had a wheat factory. And he documented everything from how much kilos he was, he was using and when and where he bought the wheat and what he did with them. For 50 years, he wrote everything about people, about the land, about his work. And you can even see the diaries that he, he bought. So this, for example. Yeah, for example, like this one is in Egypt. يصدرها سنويا مفكرة التمدن لسنة 1927 1927 and the person who used to publish these was called Halima Ahmed and he had printers of Yala al Kijan Masr and you can buy this in the library of the Sheikh Ali Shanab Batanta oh <laughs> <laughs> so not only you oh. can you know know things about Badr Sharaf but you can also suddenly understand and see This was published in 
Egypt, but was sold in Syria. And then he was writing mm. on it. And this was from Ramallah, mm. Education Bookshop, the Modern Library, 1979. Here he wrote something, If you don't have something, you can't give it. That's the translation. Like a person who lacks something, who doesn't have something, can't give it. As if he puts a yeah. note to himself. Yeah. It's, Don't it's forget. Like, it's, a, it's like a headline. And he has all of his, uh, where he lives, the address, what he works. And then you have his bank account details. <laughs> <laughs> so he, as I understand, he lost everything in, in, in Nexa. He lost all of the wheat. We have a colleague here who knows about this story. Can you just add something to that? Yes, there's something interesting. If you open like the diary of uh, 1948, you will find that he stopped writing in May. The last day he wrote in May, it was like uh, the 12th of May. And there was like 10 days that he didn't write anything. And if you open the page of uh, the Nakba, the 15th of May, like you don't have anything no notes nothing the same happened the same in the other happened. diary it's like yeah. that day was such a day of so many events yeah. that people did not go and sit down and write exactly. in their notebooks and mm. that explains why until today you know when we try to document the experience of, of nakba a lot of people just have trauma they can't they can't talk about it like because of of, of their trauma and their grief they didn't handle it they couldn't deal with it, anything uh, i'm now this is 1948 his grandchild said that she always um, had known her grandfather like angry she didn't like him but after like she found his diaries she understood like why he acted like that mm. the same story of yeah. al-haddad yeah. yeah look this is the first of may saturday Today, the family and the children traveled from Jerusalem to Egypt via bus. They went through Al Khalil, Hebron. We reached Al Khalil at night. We stayed there until Sunday and then we went. And when we got to Abu Aqil, they told us to go back. We went to Al Khalil and then we tried again to go to Al Ismailiya, to Egypt. And we reached there in the middle of the night and we stayed there. So he left to Egypt. Mm. And then, as you can see, there's barely, yeah. barely anything written. Just some short notes. Yeah. yeah. Here we can see the small diary pocket of him in 1967. He wrote some information about Indonesia. <laughs> mm. How much the population of Indonesia and what is the capital? He wrote that the Jakarta, the capital and the biggest uh, cities there. How much he has to pay for rent. Some people in Kuwait, their addresses. It's really like a random notebook where he just, whatever he wants to remember. I think these days when we, we have our mobile phones, so mm -hmm. you just save yeah. a document or you just do, you write a note somewhere or you yeah. just do a voice recording to yourself. And he was walking around with this little notebook because you can easily slip this into your pocket. And look here, this is interesting. In 27th of September, he wrote that there was a curfew. Because they wanted to to take like the statistics and to see how many people are living there, mm. so they there was a curfew. Nobody allowed to leave is, their homes. Yeah, and mm. this is interesting. Like you can take just one, just this small detail, and then make an entire research yeah. on why was there a curfew and why on the Wednesday of twenty seventh of September, and then you can probably connect it with other people and connect it with other events that happened in the same day. So if there was a curfew, was there more demonstrations the day after or? Yeah, if international scholars who are doing research for a master's or a PhD, if they wanted to come and have access to your archive in order to connect the dots and write stories, mm -hmm. that is something that is possible that they can come and look through these materials yeah. yes yes of course we can help if they knew arabic it would be a lot easier but of course we can help and we can try and uh, you know tell them it depends on what they are looking for like the theme or the years and we can more or less know where to direct them one more interesting thing look here 27th of december the budget for the israeli municipality 
to the Israeli Jerusalem, 72 million, to Arab Jerusalem, to Palestinian Jerusalem, 10 million. This was in the 27th of December. This was after the Nexa, so he stayed in Jerusalem. And, you know, when they occupied East Jerusalem, you can see 72 millions against 10 million. Yeah, yeah. you could imagine that he was reading a newspaper. He saw this information. He was like, I have to write that down to show how much of inequality from the very beginning in 1967 Wow, it's a treasure. It's a treasure, yes. Yeah. It's a treasure and it it, it hurts. <laughs> mm. But these are all documented. These are all scanned. Uh, you can see them on the website. There's a blog dedicated just to the story that you can read. You know, these characters, these people, when you read their stories and when you open their archive, they become alive again. Mm. Like they're here with us again. You can know that they're not gone. Their stories are not gone. And this is the importance of the archives. And this is important also to to say that, you know, when we feel that I don't have anything important to say, I don't have anything important to document or to preserve. Why does anyone need a pamphlet about a supermarket that opened just across my street? Like, that doesn't make sense and that's not important. But it is, it is. And um, then you can feel that, no, you are important. Mm. Document. Yeah. They have your own chazan. <laughs> also because you don't know what is going to happen in the future yeah. that may make that specific document extremely important yeah. for understanding the context yes. and for remembering things that are not there anymore. I also see a number of books here in boxes. Mm -hmm. Do you also collect books or save books from people who, I don't know, like who don't yeah. want to, to get yeah, to, we, to lose yeah. them? <laughs> yes, we collect books but these books uh, especially I think we are going to distribute to libraries mm. that I need them because you know we're trying to be specific as much as we can but there are some very important books that are very you know like old and so we we preserve them in in another place mm. before we started recording yeah. the podcast you mentioned something about a project where you were taking children to libraries that was something that was also done by Ghazayan yes yes it was called uh, Jerusalem My Library Al-Quds Maktabati we organized a project where schools and children we would take them to three libraries in the old city of Jerusalem and you know like the libraries in Jerusalem are very I'm not going to say like they don't have a lot of visitors and people don't know about them and that is sad and we try to revive this and to let them know where those libraries are what they have in the libraries because they are all very old and it's a treasure and we we did some reading activities inside those libraries we taught them about archiving about the papers that was used they also had an art workshop afterwards where they made something. Sometimes they used clay, sometimes they used paper. And yeah, we are now working also on training other people and training institutions of how to archive. So there's a lot of collaborations between us and uh, Rawak and us and Khalili Sakahini. There's a lot of uh, other organizations that we try to really make it, you know, like a skill and make it move forward mm. <laughs> and spread as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that I didn't ask or that we didn't speak about that you still want to share with us, with the podcast listeners? One podcast will not be enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say that uh, each person has his own story and, and don't wait to be history to write your own story. Just document everything. Mm. Pay attention to the details around you. We live in an abnormal place. Nothing here is normal. Our reality is very, very hard. We live under colonization and occupation. And every day there is someone that is trying to delete us and erase us and change everything that we know. So be aware of it. It's our role here to document everything and to write everything. And just, you know, like whenever you see a pamphlet on the floor, pick it up. <laughs> Well, you inspired me because as a student at the Bible College in Bethlehem, studying for the tour guide program, one of our sources that we used a lot was from pilgrims and visitors who were coming to the Holy Land and then documenting what they saw here. And all of these diaries are used now to describe what Palestine looked like empty. centuries ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and some of them actually, well, some of them would say empty, but Honestly speaking, if we're looking to the ones that are used, yeah. 
they show that it wasn't empty. We are reading from travelers who are writing about visiting theaters in Jaffa or in Haifa and going around meeting lots of people. So that is a proof that there was life in Palestine before the state of Israel was created. And since I am also a foreigner living here, I'm now kind of inspired when talking to you and looking at all those boxes and you telling me the importance of documenting things, sometimes through the eyes of a foreigner for whom everything is a bit new, different and exotic. So you write down maybe different aspects in somebody who lives here. And then, as you say, just like write your story, even though today it may not seem so important or relevant, but also Collect flyers, collect posters, collect even small receipts, because in the future, they may mean something. Exactly. If people want to know more, to follow your blog, if they want to see your social media posts, I will post a link in the show notes of this podcast. So just go to the show notes, click on that link, and then you can find Gaza and, and uh, follow it. Is it only in Arabic or do you have it also in English? Most of the things are in Arabic right now, but we try as much as we can to translate. But if anyone needs some translation or anything, you can always contact us. Or use Google Translate. Thanks God for this technology. <laughs> Iman, I want to thank you very much for your time. It's been really inspiring and beautiful to see. We will post a few pictures also on social media so that people can have a bit of an idea what all those yes, boxes yeah. look like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine, the, you know, like the listener's imagination when they're hearing those stories and the diaries. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Pax Palestine podcast. If you want to know more about the work of Pax, you can visit their website paxforpeace.nl or click the link in the show notes of this podcast. My name is Crystal and you can find my weekly podcast Stories from Palestine on your favorite podcast player or on the website storiesfrompalestine.info. Thank you for listening to Stories from Palestine. If you enjoy the podcast, then here are several things you can do to support the show. Tell your friends about the podcast. Share some of the social media posts on Instagram or Facebook. Start following the YouTube channel. You can also hear the podcast audio there. And soon I will start uploading videos. Sign up for the email list so that you get a reminder with a clickable link to the new podcast episode and in the future you will be updated about programs and trips that I will start to organize. And of course you can donate to help me pay for hosting the podcast and the website and all the related recording costs. It's the only source of income I have at the moment so you can imagine how much I appreciate every cup of coffee or falafel sandwich that you buy me on the Kofi platform. All the links that you need can be found in the show notes and on the website storiesfrompalestine.info. That's it. I hope you will tune in again next week. If you enjoy listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, then I think you will also enjoy listening to my favorite podcast, which is called Jerusalem Unplugged. You can find it on most podcast players and on social media at Jerusalem Unplugged.